Hare Pramaya. hear me. I think, I think everybody online can hear me now, because I just joined with my, um, I joined the, the sound, I put the sound on. So if anybody can't hear me, then you can just notify me if you cannot hear what I'm saying. I'm sure I'll be notified shortly if that's the case. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see all of you here today. Some of you that I haven't seen in a while. Amen? Amen. Um, as you know, today is going to be the last time you're going to see me standing here for a while. So, it is my privilege, my honor, that you have put up with me so long. Amen? Again, right? You have to share this pulpit with, with, with a human like me. But uh, <laughs> but it's been it's been a, a real privilege and an honor for me. Uh, if you look at me and you think that I look a little depressed today, it's because I'm very sad. But pray for me when I stand here before you. topic this morning is entitled The Manner in Which God's Word is Beholden. Amen? The Manner in Which God's Word is Beholden. You know, it seems as if the world is being plagued by a family. You might say, well, what are you talking about, Pablo? Because it doesn't seem like there's any family around me. But the Bible states in Amos 8, 11 to 13, it says, and we're going to pray in a minute, but it says this, Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of, and we know what this means, we know God is not the one sending famines, but it's just the way it's written. But it says, Behold, says the Lord, I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. By the time we finish this, this message today, you're going to understand this in a completely different context. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. You think that they're looking for the fountain of living waters but they can't find it? That's the only way we can faint for a thirst in a spiritual way, right? Amos 8, 11 to 13. Now, we know that this prophecy is primarily speaking of the time just after the creation closes, right? We know this. But is there another context in which we can apply this we're going to see that today there is. Are there some fair virgin and young men out there right now longing for some truth but they can scarcely find it in their areas or maybe from the churches in their neighborhoods or whatever? Think about that. Or are there people out there that need the amazing truths that we have but there's no one around them to give to them. To give them the last rays of merciful light. I would say yes. Do you say yes? Yes. But what is this? Because God has told us the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And because most of God's professed people 
are in a sleeping stupor. That's the truth. And today we're going to take a look at the manner in which God's word is beyond it. This scripture, Amos 8, 11 to 13, is going to take it in a whole other context for us. And my prayer is that we can be encouraged to become, listen to this very carefully, to become God's word made audible. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I just want to thank you for this wonderful congregation. And I know even though we're going to part physically, that we're going to part spiritually as we remain faithful in you. And so as we open up your word this afternoon, even now, we pray that you will take charge. Take charge of my mind, my heart, my lips, my thoughts, even the expressions on my countenance. I pray that you will take charge, complete charge, over me. That you will use me as your messenger of light. I pray also for this congregation, Lord, that you give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to follow you all the way till death and translation, whichever comes our way. And so, dear Father, may your presence be with us, and may your angels surround us at this time. And bless not only us that are here physically, according to the requests in this prayer, but also to those that are listening to this online or at any time. For we ask this according to your will, in the name of Jesus, with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. So by coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God. You with me? Amen. He came to reveal God both to men and to angels. And reading from the Zion of Ages, page 19, paragraph 2, it says, He was the Word of God, God's thought made audible. That's probably hard to understand. God, in his prayer for his disciples, he says, I have the kids that thy name. This is what Jesus said. What was this that he declared? It says, and he goes on to say, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. When it says that God's thought became audible, it doesn't mean that Jesus was a creature or a creator or spoken to creation or being. He was always self-existent. It's just a figure of speech. God's thought being audible. You know what comes after thoughts? When something becomes audible. When you're thinking something and you speak it, it becomes something. What does it become? Words. This is, these, these are just, this is like metaphoric language, you know. Christ became the Word. But was He always really the Word? Of course, He's always God. He's always been there. These are just things that God uses to give us some kind of understanding. Sometimes, for us, because we are so finite, it becomes confusing to many of us, right? Because we take things, these figures of speech, and we're trying to figure them all out. But God... Christ is the word. And you know what? He says, I am declaring to them your name, your character. So when we saw Christ, we were seeing God. If Christ came to earth as God's thought made audible, in the sense that he came, he became, or was, was identified as the word of God, which we know was God, and was always with God. If Christ came as God taught me audible, and you and I are to be one with God, then you and I are to likewise be God's or become God's thought made audible, which is His word. Are you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Are you ready? 
Is this heresy? No. no. <laughs> Let's see if there's some scriptures that back these things up. Because I don't want to just say something that is not backed up by the Word of God, right? Everything we claim must be backed up by the Word of God. Do you agree with that? Matter of fact, the Bible says, I have a Bible, two or three witnesses of truth shall be established. We need evidence. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or we be, as some others, and persons of condemnation to you, or letters of condemnation from you? In other words, we have to, if there's something that we, we, we need you to confirm the evidence in us. Is that, is that what we need? Should the evidence be automatically? The evidence itself proves things. Don't it? If, if, if uh, you take a piece of paper and you put it into a fire, the evidence is that the fire burns, you put that paper in the fire. <laughs> right? That's all the evidence. In other words, the, the fire of God must be burning inside of us. And the evidence will automatically be seen. We don't need commendation, in other words, right? But this is what he's saying. Do we need this? He says, no, you are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. In other words, that's how people see the work of God taking place in you. You're known, you're an epistle, you are, you are written. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Amen? Wait a minute. If we become epistles of Christ, then we must become the words of Christ. Amen. Is that right? Wow. Anybody here want to be the word of Christ? Amen. Praise the Lord. And his and his only, his only, all his words. You know that Satan sits back and derides God because many of us are speaking a different message. They're reading a different, the world is reading something different. They're saying God's a liar. That's what they're reading from us sometimes. God is a liar. God is a thief. God is the devil. You know the sickness teach that? That God is the one that's evil and the devil is the one that's holy and good. Right? No. That shouldn't be what people are reading from us. Notice here, 2 Corinthians 7, 3, verse 18. To chapter 4, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Starting from verse 18 to chapter 4 and verse 2. Notice what it says. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a class the glory of the Lord, are changed in the same image from glory to God. If we are changed into the same image by beholding God, then the people should be seeing Him when they see us. Words are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And we're going to see how this plays into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil versus the tree of the knowledge of life, the tree of life, as we move on. We're going to see this. But we all, the Lord face, the Lord has been asked, the Lord of the Lord, are changing the same image from the Lord of the Lord, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. As we were talking about earlier, you know, some people want to faint, they're asked to come up here and do some ministry. What does it say? God's going to faint not. Is that your book? I mean, I'm not trying to... <laughs> I just I throw that in there, you know? It's just, I don't know. Faith not. Anybody need that word? Yes. Okay. I mean, we're going to move people up here. Amen. 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 But have we now 
renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but notice here other line is, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Remember right here? Paul saying to me, there is a commendation. The answer was no, right? We don't need any other. But notice here. These are, we are the letter of commendation. That's what Paul was saying. We don't need letters of commendation. We must be the letter of commendation. That's what it says here. Manifestation, by, by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Well, the final part of this scripture, which I just mentioned that I have underlined here, reveals that the manifestation of the truth will result when we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, God is waiting for you and I to allow this to take place through us. Praise the Lord. And you know, I always refer back to Proverbs 25, and I know you know this. Because it tells us how we will commend ourselves to every man's conscience. And you want to know the answer to that? Notice Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. How is it that we commend ourselves? And the other we're not commending ourselves. You know, it's not that we're commending ourselves, but it means that we are doing the work that was called to do in ministry in every man's conscience. How do we do that? Proverbs 25, 21, 22. If your enemy hunger, feed him. Give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. Why? Because this is how we're commending ourselves to every man's conscience. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon there, his conscience. That's where the, the conscience is. In front of the Lord of the head. In the mind, in the, in the, right there in front of the skull. And the Lord shall reward thee. Right? That's up front, front, front of the lobe is the front, front of the part of the brain, the right side of the front part of your skull. And guess what? That's how you're going to commend yourself or really, in the conscience of people. You know, be, you'll be, and you, if you, if it's your sin, it's yourself, because you're self state, right? So who will be your commanding? You will be, be commanding Christ to them. In other words, you are now representing Christ to them. They are meeting Christ face to face when they see you because you have become his representative. And this is the primary way, by the way, that we will give God's word to others. But there's only one way that this can be done. We must become one with our Maker. Isaiah 54 verse 5 says, For thy Maker is my husband. We have to be married to our Maker. Amen? God claims that He's our husband. You know what He says here? Isaiah 54 5. For thy maker is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. How is it that this, our maker is going to be called the God of the whole earth? When it's people here in the program. We must allow the prayer of Jesus to come to fruition, brethren. We must choose this if we want to honor our maker, our king, our husband. Our hearts need to be converted. Amen? And that's not just one time. That's every moment. And God is longing for our hearts to reflect the heart of Christ. Listen to the scribe in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29. Let me see if you can catch this. Or hear the cry of the Lord in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Notice what he says here. And picture God crying these words 
Oh, that there is such a heart in them. That they will fear me and keep all my commandments always. That it might be well with them and with their children forever. Think about that. Imagine God crying, sobbing these words. He wants it to be well with us. You know, there's a song, It is well with my soul. That is God's desire for every single one of us. And when we violate the principles of selflessness, we hurt ourselves. And we hurt other people at the same time. That's why it says, I, 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 I want it to be well with them and their children forever. Because whatever we do affects our children, doesn't it? That's right. He longs for us, brethren, to return to our original condition. The condition that we were in when he first created mankind. Notice Ezekiel 28.15. And you know, most of the time we apply this, rightly so, to the fallen angel, Lucifer, which became Satan, Right? Ezekiel 28, 15. But we're going to apply this to ourselves today. He says, Thou was perfect in thy way from the day that thou was created to the name of his family. <laughs> Is this true in regard to the human race? Absolutely. Just like he applied to Lucifer when he was when he fell, it applies to the human race. When they fell, when we fell. But God wants to restore us back to the original condition. Amen? The human race was created perfect, wasn't it? Was it? Yes. Did it have any sickness? Any disease? Any flaws? Any carnal thoughts? Any lusts? The human race was created perfect. And by faith, we can allow Him, God, to bring us back to that condition. If we only believe. This is why Christ says in Matthew 5 48, most of you know by memory, be ye therefore perfect. Let me repeat that word. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. In other words, as you behold the perfect God, you will become the perfect human child of God. You, because you become the divine human, just like Jesus Christ was the Lord of God. Amen? Some people don't like that word. I, I want to be perfected. Man, I'm pretty glad I'm pretty. Lord, have mercy. When God finished Creating man. He actually gave him some instructions. You know. He didn't just leave him there and say, okay, you're on your own. He gave, he gave him some instructions on how to maintain that profession. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and see if we can find the instructions on how to maintain perfection. We have to see how this applies to us today. Because if God said it back then, then there was something in that that would help us today. Yes. You with me? Praise the Lord. Notice Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the land thou is free to eat, but of the tree of the land of good and evil, thou shalt not hear that tree. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Which is the tree that he said you should, you, you should go and eat from? That was the, 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 the middle of the garden. What was it? Or he put in the garden. What was it? It had 12 manner of fruits. Tree of life. He said, that's the one I want you to eat. Eat, eat from that tree. But that one over there, it's not good for you. Stay away from that one. Because that one brings death. So they had a choice. They can choose to either continue eating from the true life or they can endeavor to take a risk and go and 
eat from the forbidden fruit, from the forbidden tree, right? The reason for the fall is found in the fact that man ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Isn't that right? And man has, let me just say this. Do you think that was the last time that man ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Let me tell you something. You might, you might not be plucking fruit from a literal tree today that symbolizes the good and evil. But man, kind, since the fall, has continuously been eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's right. Man has been doing that ever since the fall. And it's time for us to break the cycle. Amen? Can we stop eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Yes. Can we stick to a diet that subsists solely on fruit from the tree of life? Can we do that today? Even though it's not a physical tree, right? But we can do that today. Yes, we can. For Isaiah reveals this very thing in Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 15. Notice what the prophet says in Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 15. Matter of fact, think about this for a minute. These are those that are described in Isaiah 33 15. These are those that are eating, serving from the tree of life. It is those that walk righteously and speak uprightly. Those that despise the gain of oppressions. Those that shake their hands from holding a bride and like, no, I don't want anything to do with that. Those that stop their ears from hearing of blood and shut their eyes from seeing evil. You know why? Because if they do all those things, they will be eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, if you take that into reverse, that is what it means to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From not shutting your eyes, but indulging in seeing evil. Are you with me? And opening up your ears to hearing of blood of the gossip. All stories. It entertains and tickles the ears. Easily can be bribed. Oh man, I'll do this to you if you do this. No, it's not the right thing. But I, I need that. You want to give me that? Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, I'll get a promotion if I just step on this other person over here. Hmm. Or if I keep my mouth quiet about what you're doing, mm. or speaking un unrighteously, speaking words of death instead of words of life. That's what it means to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Using your senses to entertain yourselves with evil. Violence and crime. Instead of letting the eyes and the ears behold God and the principles of holiness. Can you with me? Paul also agrees in Romans chapter 16, verse 19. He says, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. What is he saying? Shut your eyes to that foolishness. Stop eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Shut your ears from hearing of violence and death, of gossip and all these other things. We have to stop feeding off of sin and start feasting 
on the bread of life. Amen? Amen. And then if we, we have, you know, we, we get a little thirsty after eating the feasting on the bread of life, you know what? God has something for us to drink. He has a fountain of living waters. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and when we start doing these things, brethren, with our whole heart, then we will become God's final sentinels to this planet. And the following prophecies, which I'm going to read now, will be finally fulfilled. Let's look at Jeremiah 15, verse 20. These are prophecies that God is waiting to be fulfilled in you and in me. Isaiah 15, verse 20 says, In those days and in that time, that sounds like a future prophecy, no? Jeremiah. Jeremiah, yeah, Jeremiah 50, verse 20. Did I say, did I say something else? Oh, my bad. Sorry. Jeremiah, chapter 15, verse 20. Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse 20. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. Let's do this. The iniquity of Israel is Israel. God's people, those who profess to be God's people, right? Notice here that there's going to come a time just before the coming of Christ. Notice here, in those days and in that time, say the Lord, and we know this is also you know, talking about when we're in heaven as well, but we, it has to be applied here first. That the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for and there shall be none. Wow. How many? There will be how many? There won't be any sins at all? Any, any iniquities at all in Israel? There shall be how many? None. And the sins of Judah. And they shall not be found. For I will pardon them whom I deserve. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. You know why these people are, and hopefully it's us, when we become living epistles, they will become God's thought made audible. They will become His word. And in His word, is there any unrighteousness in His word? No. Not at all. What about Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 13? Zephaniah chapter 3. Verse 13. Remember, we're looking at prophecies that they prove that God will have a people that will become His word. And this is the manner in which God's word will be beholden. Zephaniah 13 says, The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity. What else? Nor speak lies. Neither shall the deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. What did it say about Christ? That in him there was no God found. Remember that? Does the sound like it apply to God's final remnant people also? They will be no God found in them because they have become like Christ. They have fulfilled the prayer of Christ to become one with Him and the Father. They, there shall be no deceitful tongue found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Amen. Praise God. They will have fear as well. And when he's listening, when they feel let out, he's going to have peace and rest. You know that? God's people will be in perfect peace, perfect rest, trusting always. Amen? Praise the Lord. What about Revelation 14, verses 4 and 5? Revelation 14, verses 4 and 5. Again, the Bible is describing those who have allowed God to make them His word, make them like Him, 
and perfect the new character. And it says, these are they. Now, the John had a vision of his people. These are they which were not defiled with women. For they are virgins. God's final women will be considered spiritual virgins. Because they're only married to one husband. Right? They have never been defiled and they become married to one husband. They have never been defiled. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. And it doesn't mean that we have never been defiled, do Because we have all been defiled in one way or another. But what does that say? He says, when we come to him and we give ourselves completely to him, he doesn't see, he doesn't look, hold on to the past. And he doesn't want us to hold on to the past either. He takes that record, he throws it to the bottom of the sea. Does it mean what the word say? And we take all of our previous sins and cast them to the bottom of the sea. And the only thing he sees now is the righteousness of Christ. That means no spot, no blemish, no wrinkle, virgin. Like virgin, virgin, uh, you know, something like that, like virgin soil, or virgin uh, materials, because there's no, there's no blemish, there's no, you know, that, that term virgin also means pure and clean. It means that our characters have become clean, and we become washed in the blood of the Lamb. These are those which are not defiled, we will live forever, and they are those which follow the Lamb. We will serve the earth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth there was, was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Man, praise the Lord. Amen. I don't want to be there. I'm telling you. And I know I'm just going all the time. But I'm hoping that one day I'll not disturb again. How about you? Amen. These prophecies reveal the closing work that God will do in and through his people. Jesus was actually our template. Notice first Peter chapter two, verse twenty one and twenty two. First Peter chapter two, verse twenty one and twenty two. Showing that Christ is our template. Because we just read that there will be no guile found in the remnant of God, but notice what it says here in 1 Peter 2, verses 21 and 22, for even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us what? A template. Isn't that what an example is? It's a template, right? When you want to go suppose a wall for hang the frame, sometimes it comes with a template, right? And when you can mark the holes perfectly, and you know that if you drill those holes perfectly in that perfect spot where the template shows you to drill those holes, then you will hang the frame perfectly. It will match the holes in the frame. That's what the template is, right? God wants us to match Him. Leaving us an example that ye should follow His steps. Who did no sin, neither was God found in His mouth. Don't look at me or any can or anybody as an example. It's Jesus and Him alone. Only He was the perfect temple. His final remnant will be the instruments that He uses to finish the work that needs to be done on earth before He can come the second time. And this final remnant will not fail. For God has said in Isaiah 55 11, So shall my words be that go forth out of my mouth. It 
shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where unto I sent it. You think he's talking about our words? He's talking about you. He's talking about me, brethren. God is speaking of us. We are to become his word, living epistles. We cannot return to him for it, brethren. We will return to him and increase. And who? Right. Because he's worthy. God has called each and every one of us to become his thoughts made by the Lord, his word. For he has already told us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Ye are a chosen generation. Ye are a royal priesthood. Ye are a holy nation. Ye are a peculiar people. Show forth the praise of him who has called us out of darkness into his own sight. It is left to us to renew our commitment right now. This moment. We must stand for this cause or die. Amen? Revelation 14, 7 says that the message that we must be transmitting with a loud voice is fear God. Give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea the fountains of water. Our lives, brethren, not just our lips, our lives must be crying out these very words. People must be able to read these words right in our lives just by looking at us. God has declared in Isaiah 43, verses 10 to 12, Ye are my witnesses. You know what he could be using angels when he said, No, I'm going to use humanity. I'm going to use man and kind, I'm going to use you to be my mouthpiece, to be my word. Ye are my witnesses, said the Lord, and I certainly have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no blood formed, and neither shall there be after me. There is no other. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared, and I have saved, and I have shown. When there was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witnesses, said the Lord, that I am God. Amen. God in us is the manner in which God will reveal himself to the world. Do you want to be God's own man today? Do you want to be his thought made audible? Do you want to be his word, living epistles to the world? Then we may invite you to take stand. After we are ready to pray, take a stand if you are committed to death or transmission through God's work. God is going to send us different ways to sometimes, you know? And sometimes it's a sweet and sour, it's a sweet and sour, because we don't really want to be out there, but at the same time, we don't want to honor God. We want to go where God leads us to go. We want to be the ones that bring the light wherever we need to go. And then, every one of us comes to the moment, eventually, maybe not this moment, maybe not another moment, but eventually each of us, something will happen to sit us somewhere. You know what we're for? To be the Word of God. To be the light of God. Amen? I want to be that. So I'm going to invite you to just pray with me. Pray for me. Let's pray for each other as we close this final message that I'll be sharing here physically. But again, I'll be sharing as God needs online. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. We're going to be alive. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, 
for your word. We thank you for calling us, giving us this high calling to become your word, which will not return unto you, Lord. I believe that it is impossible for your word to return to you, Lord. And so, my family, help us to become those living epistles. Help us, Lord, to become more and more like you every day. We need your power. We need your strength. We need your divine intervention. Come to our hearts. Take charge. Bind us to Jesus Christ. And Lord, whether we're here in person or far or near, we know that Lord, if we're one in Christ, we can never be a proud spiritually. And so we have to bring our hearts together as Christ has prayed that we may become one. And now we just want to thank you for the time we've had here with my family. And thank you for this congregation. Continue to bless this congregation and all the can and all of the brethren here. Continue to pour out your spirit upon this little church, this little group. Continue to bring each one together with the cords that have been broken. And Lord, may the work here and fire it will just continue to expand. May we be part of your movement that fills the earth with the light of the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. That this controversy can find the river of yours. For the Lord, this is your desire, and your will, and your will, and it's ours as well. And Lord, we thank you. And we praise you. And we ask you to the name of Jesus, our husband. Amen. 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 And in the words of our mouth and the temptations of our hearts, we accept the Lord in our sight, we will be our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Amen.